So now we have our diffusion equation. So from this diffusion equation, we will derive um, the solution of, the, of this diffusion equation. So we will look at three specific um, Avner's applications. So the first one is um, time domain. So in time domain Avner's, the source is um, is actually a very um, short pulse of um, photons. Um, it, so that could be expri uh, expressed as a delta function at the um, location of zero and then at the um, time zero. So if we insert this uh, time domain equation into our um, diffusion equation, uh, we can have the analytical solution to this diffusion equation. I wouldn't go into details of how to derive it, but I will just directly um, give you the analytical solution to it. So that will look, that'll be like phi at the location r at time t equals to v times s zero and then four pi divided by four pi d t to the power of three over two times exponential of a big term. So that would be minus r squared over four times d times t minus v times mu a times t. So this is the analytical solution to the diffuse equation when the source term is actually a, um, a delta function, um, which is the case in time domain at nearest application. Um, so from this solution, um, I want to point it out, I want to point out um, two um, conclusions that we can derive from it. Um, so the first one is how the um, photon um, forms distributed with uh, the distance r or the position r looks like. So um, we can see that r term show up here. Um, so the relation between phi and r actually follow, follows a Gaussian distribution. So that means the distribution of phi over r should look like a Gaussian distribution. So here is the source position uh, zero and then uh, at different at each location different distance from um, the source zero the um, the phi actually follows a uh, Gaussian distribution shape and the second one is the relationship between phi and t so we have t term here and then t term here. We also have t term here, but the change changing, uh, if we change t here, actually this term is not changing a lot, but the exponential term is going to change a lot. So this term, the exponential term is actually dominating the change of phi. Um, so the phi, along t from t equals to zero um so at the uh, the source is actually going to eject a pulse of uh, photons so that will be our delta uh, function and then um, the phi when t is actually very small the first term here is dominating 
um, is really large comparing to this term. Um, so that at the beginning, when t is actually very small, uh, the phi will look like this, going up very quickly. And then um, when t is large enough, the second term is starting to take over um, so that uh, after some time, it will be like this. Um, so that when we ignore this term, the exponential of negative uh, minus uh, the e the exponential of minus v times mu a times t will look like a decreasing you know exponentially uh, decreasing curve. Um, so that's also what we observed um, in time domain um, at near system. Um, so that by fitting into an exponential term, exponential curve into this um, ex experimentally collected data, we can derive what's the absolute value of mu a. Um, so that's um, time domain system. The second case is frequency domain system. So in frequency domain system, uh, we will have a modulated light source. That means the source uh, is, con is composed of two parts, the DC part, which doesn't change over time, and AC part, which is changing at some uh, frequency. So here we use the angular frequency uh, omega here to express that. So since the light source is actually um, the sum of two parts, the uh, photon fluence uh, could also be expressed as two parts, the DC part and also the AC part. And we know here is that the derivative of phi over t, if we express it as two parts, dc part and ac part, um, that could be equal to negative i times omega times phi. So the diffusion equation can be written as negative i omega times phi minus d double gradients of phi. So now phi is at the location and at the frequency of omega plus v times mu a times phi equals to s times v. And then we can further combine uh, each term here together and then we can extract um, phi outside. So that will be look like double gradient plus k squared times phi equals to v negative v over d times s. Um, so he square here equals to negative v times mu a plus i times omega over d. So this equation here is actually ham house equation. So I wouldn't go into details again how to derive the analytical solution to this Helmholtz equation. Um, I'll just uh, take it, uh, just put it here, phi equals to v times s over 4 pi times d times e negative k 
pay the real part times r times e exponential of i times omega t minus k imagine part times r and over r. So this is the analytical solution. What is k real part and what is k imagined part? So I would I will not go to the details of how to derive it, but so uh I'll just write it down for ease. What is k real part and what is k imagined part? So that is the solution to the uh, frequency domain um, system. So the last one is the continuous wave system, which is the most commonly used FNIR system now. So here, continuous wave is very similar to frequency domain, but it only has DC part in the uh, light source. It doesn't have a uh, an AC part is not modulated, so it's just a, a constant light source. So that means the uh, angular angular frequency part is equal to zero. Um, so that means k square equals to negative v times mu a over d. So that makes the um, diffusion equation looks like. times phi equals to minus v over d times s. So that is uh, the diffusion equation for the continuous wave system. Again, I wouldn't go to details of how to solve this equation, but I would just put the analytical solution here. So now we have analytical solutions to time domain system, um, frequency domain system, and then continuous wave domain system, continuous wave system. Um, so from now on, we will only focus on the continuous wave of your system. Um, so we will uh, see how we can um, build up our uh, forward model and inverse model based on this um, analytical solution of continuous wave system. Um, so first thing is that in FNIR's application, um, actually the changes in HBO hemoglobin, oxygen hemoglobin, and the oxygen hemoglobin concentration is going to cause the change in mu A. And then we can use the detector to detect the um, uh, intensity change, the photon force changes. Um, by measuring that part, we want to derive what is ch the change in mu A. And then from the change of mu A, we can derive the change in HBO and HBR. Since we want to know the how the perturbation in mu a is going to affect the change in uh, phi, so we want to know that uh, relation. So first, we need to express that perturbation in our uh, optical property changes in our tissue including um, mu a at the location r equals to the initial mu a plus the perturbation change of mu a. And then the diffusion coefficient is also going to be changed uh, with the change with the change of uh, hemoglobin concentration. So we do the same. D at the R equals to the initial value of D plus the perturbation of D. So that's our uh, perturbation of uh, optical uh, properties. Um, next, we will see, okay, what's the change 
um, in photon fluence phi. So there are two ways of doing it. The first one is called Born approximation, which means that we could do the same to um, the photon fluence phi. So that means phi equals to the initial value of phi plus the uh, perturbation, the change in phi. That is a very straightforward way of expressing the change in phi. Uh, it's basically the same to the perturbation of optical properties. Um, the second way of doing it is called Breitov approximation. So right of uh, approximation is expressed it's not a co linear combination of uh, phi zero and delta phi. It is actually saying everything happened in the exponential space. So phi zero plus delta phi. And then since they are in the exponential space so that we can written, we can write it as this. And then this, the first term is the um, initial Value so that would be phi zero r r s times e delta phi r r s. Um. So now delta phi can be written as a uh, negative logarithm of phi over phi zero. So, you sh uh, so in practice, people are mostly using a uh, Raktov approximation because it is more robust to uh, the noise in the real uh, measurement because we use uh, the phi divided by phi zero, so that will cancel out a lot of noise. And then um, there are not a lot of people are using Born approximation. Um, so here we will move forward with the Rechtov approximation here. So with Rechtov approximation, we can say, okay, the perturbation of uh, phi, the change in phi, is actually over measurement. So we will put use y to express it, and then that will equal to negative uh, natural log of phi over phi zero. And from our analytical solution here, we can we know what is uh, uh, we we can insert this uh, analytical solution into this, and then that will be negative v over d times something. So it's from actually it's from here. So if we do natural, so when we do the Phi divided by phi zero, um, all this canceled out, and then we only left with this term. And then this term is in the exponential space. And then since we do a natural log here, so the exponential also uh, canceled out. 
and then we only have v times mu a times d here so we put v over d and then what we really need is something can be expressed as delta mu a from our source location and our detector location so what is the delta mu a um, change um, if we know the source location and the detector location so here we need to introduce the construction of green function um, so the, so here is the uh, green function and then um, it means if we want to know a function of fx uh, we can do the integral over another variable s but we need e, the uh, green function times the f itself and then we do the integral over uh, s so we basically do the same here um, to derive the delta mu a um, so that could be the integral um, over the r um, so R means every location in our um, tissue. So uh, if we do the integral of R, um, then we can put delta mu A R here. Um, so because delta mu A is our F function here, and then the variable here is the geometrically geometrical location R in our tissue um, and then we need the uh, green function so we have two variables here the source location and the um, the detector location which is our x here so that will be the green function of rs r times green function r d r and then we need to do a normalization of this green uh, this green function so that will be green function of rs and then rd then we can discretize it as y equals to minus vd and then we discretize it to a uh, different delta r so that would be g s g s means the green function of r s and r and g d and then over g s d times um to this discretize the geometry space r uh, times delta mu a so in um have near the application delta mu a is actually the x the unknowns we want to uh, calculate we want to derive from this equation and then this whole term we can express it as our sensitivity function a so the sensitivity a matrix here um, actually we know every term except the g function the green function so for the sensitivity to derive so how do we derive the sensitivity matrix a here so here in this equation we basically if we know how to describe discretize over geometry um, tissue we know the delta r and then we know the property of our tissue v and d then what is unknown here is only the uh, green function um, so how to derive the green function um, there are um, three ways to derive a here so the first one is uh, we can derive the analytical solution of um, green function so green function here is basically a delta function means that we for example gs means we put at we were at a very short time we 
put a lot of photon ejecting from our source position and how the um, distribution of those photons should be look like. So if we have a very simple geometry assumption of our head, for example, we can assume it's just an infinite plane, or we can say, okay, it's a, a sphere. So we can um, derive the analytical solution of our uh, green function here. Um, so next, the next one is uh, we can use finite element to solve if we have a very, um, very complex head model, uh, we can use the finite element solution to calculate what is the G uh, green function here. The last one is uh, Monte Carlo. Method, so Monte Carlo method is to simulate a lot of photon ejecting from the position of the source and then at each location we assign the possibility that it is the photon is going to be absorbed or um, be scattered and um, using that possibility statistical possibility values we can calculate how's the distribution of photon looks like. And that is uh, our um, green function. So I will put um, some example figures here to show you how the green function looks like. So after calculating our sensitivity matrix A, either from analytical solution or finite element solution or Monte Carlo simulation, we can build up our forward model here. Which is y equals to a times x. After building up our forward model to solve uh, what is x here, we need to solve this inverse problem, which is x equals to, so we need to do the inverse of a, so that can, I wouldn't go to details of it, but it can be expressed as this. So x equals to a transpose times y over a transpose times a. In most FNIRS application, uh, A transpose times A is very singular, so that this problem is a unit problem. Um, so that because usually we have way less measurements comparing to the unknowns. So the unknown is like much more than the measurements we have making this inverse problem a ill-conditioned problem. Um, so to solve that uh, problem, usually we will do a regularization to that inverse problem. So the most commonly used way is to add a regularization term lambda onto the uh, matrix of A transpose times A. This is the simplest way of doing it, but there are like a lot of different ways to do the regularization of this inverse problem. Um, I wouldn't go to like more details of it. I just show, show a case of how you can do it. Um, so that's it. This whole uh, series of videos um, have uh, showed you how to derive from transport equation to diffusion equation and then to build up our forward model and then how to solve the inverse problem, which is very useful in FNIRS application.